welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, a bit of course action. We're with XMP and now Angling Trust Ambassador Martin Salter to talk water, cormorants and, of course, fishing. Gundog experts, it's the latest in our series of tips from the top trainers in the country. We have News Stump, we have Hunting YouTube, and first we have Roy Lupton, who, like many deer stalkers across the country, has been trying to finish his doe cull in the last few weeks. We look at the impact that has on the herd, and because of head shooting, on Roy. Culling deer is a necessary part of deer management, especially in parkland. With no natural predators and where there is limited space and food, it is man's job to remove the weak and infirm. This kind of deer management often involves head shooting the animals. There are arguments for and against, but crucially, all shooting is about accuracy. A bad shot is a bad shot, wherever it is on the body. What we're going to be doing today is we're going to be going into a park and we're going to be carrying out the end of a doe cull. We've got about five beasts to take out today and all of the animals that we're going to take today, we're going to head shoot them. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to double check the rifle zero. The rifle should be okay and smack on, but you never know if it gets knocked. If something happens as you're traveling or as you're putting it in and out of the cabinet, you can sometimes smack the scopes. So always before I go and do something like this, I always just double check with a couple of shots and make sure. With the deer that we're going to be shooting today, the target area that we were looking at is relatively small. You've got about an apple sized target. So if you can't shoot that apple consistently 10 out of 10 times at whatever range you're planning to shoot the deer at, then you really shouldn't be stretching your ranges out to that. With the rifle shooting true, Roy now has a shot at a couple of apples to represent his target. They disintegrate on impact. He's as happy as he can be. The next thing is to be selective. This park has plenty of animals. Some will have shrugged off the wet wintry weather. Some won't be faring that well. It's up to the managers to make the right choices for the health of the herd. Roy's friend is the first to get into position for a shot. There are two or three animals away from the main herd that are suitable. At this point we must just add that head shooting is not pretty. For this first deer we used a high speed camera to film the impact. We've decided the image is too graphic to show in Field Sports Britain. However, we think it is of interest for deer managers and stalkers, so we have uploaded it with an 18 certificate. If you want to watch it and you're watching this film on YouTube, then please click the link. Roy's friend repositions and takes a second doe. It's all quick and the main herd hasn't moved. The other stalker that we're uh, culling with this afternoon just got over there and pulled off a couple of nice shots. So uh, that's two on the ground now, so we've got to find the other three. We've got a group just over there behind us, but they're not offering a, a safe backstop where they are at the moment. They're getting a little bit rangy for the uh, conditions today. So we're just going to go over the, the rise here. We know there's a couple of deer feeding, hopefully not too far off, maybe about 100, 150 yards in front there. So we'll uh, move towards those and hopefully take another couple. We leave the animals and make our way to a vantage point 500 metres away. Roy discusses which animal or animals are good to take. Do you want to wait? OK. Once the young animal has settled to graze, Roy takes his chance. It's number three in less than 10 minutes. OK, it was a shame we couldn't take a few more out of that group. We had one of this year's fawns stop, and um, the reason we took that one is it, it didn't look too good. It wasn't carrying a, a lot of weight. So although the winter's pretty much done, it, uh, it definitely wasn't doing that well. So we took that one off, and it would have been nice to take out another couple from that group, but uh, nothing wanted to stop. So we'll have to move on and hopefully catch up on another couple. Now the fallows start moving. We still have to employ a level of field craft. This is by no means shooting the proverbial fish in a barrel. The next doe is 60 yards away and Roy's friend uses an ancient oak to get a steady shot. Another reason that we head shoot when in this scenario is obviously when the animals are coming through and an animal comes forward, its head is, is normally very clear of the rest of the group. Um, whereas if you were trying to take body shots, 
it would be incredibly difficult to try and take a body shot without another animal moving in behind it or already behind it. The herd starts to work its way towards us. And we've got uh, a nice setup here with a good safe backstop. And if they stop and present a shot, then we'll, uh, we'll take the shot here. So the dark doe, lock the second one right there. It's another good shot and the job is done. This kind of work requires skill, which means plenty of practice. And it is work, not sport. You know, you look at it and you think it's, uh, it's quite a wonderful job, but uh, after you've done it for a little while, it can put you off your stalking, which I found, um, because you're shooting so many animals. And although you've still got to stalk them because they are primarily wild deer, even though they're in a park, um, when you're shooting a number of animals um, each time that you go in and cull, it can get a little bit repetitive. And now we've got all the animals on the floor, this is when the real work begins. So uh, we've now got to go and larder the five beasts and uh, get them back and get them sorted and uh, ready to go into the food chain. The team pick up the animals in reverse order. The doe that was shot first is first to be processed. It isn't too warm a day. So this is the fawn that we took. And again, you can see, I mean, he is just absolute skin and bone. So uh, it wasn't doing very well, that one. You could see the way it was lagging behind the rest of the group. Um, and it just was not going to make, uh, make old bones, that one. It could not have gone any better, and the herd have already started to couch down and get on with life. Deer culling is one thing, head shooting is another. As we said at the start, there are reasons for and against. The main thing is that it is done safely, proficiently, and with the welfare of the animals at the heart of it. We have made lots of deer stalking videos over the years. Click on the link on the screen if you'd like to see them. Now for more mind-blowing facts and fancies, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Britain News. Denmark has its first wolf for 200 years. This fuzzy photograph shows what experts now believe to be a live wolf and follows an autopsy on a dead canine now confirmed as a wolf. Spotted in northern Jutland, they're thought to have travelled up from Germany. Staying with large dogs and after seeing last week's bulletin, Scott McKenzie, head keeper on the Ellen Earman estate on the Isle of Skye, sent in these pictures. Shot a few nights ago in a field where the crofters getting ready to lamb, it measured 52 inches from nose to tail, but only weighed 18 pounds. He calls it a true large hill fox, not a dustbin raider. The League Against Cruel Sports is to deploy aerial drones in its fight to prove that British hunts are killing foxes. This film shows the strength of feeling against drones in the USA, where they're regularly shot down. Black's chief executive, Joe Duckworth, says there is a war in the countryside. A spokesman for the Countryside Alliance tried to raise civil liberty issues, but couldn't stop laughing. The Angling Trust is warning British fishers away from rodlicense.net. It's a commercial website that's not as good as the Environment Agency's Rod Licence website and charges you an extra £11 for using it. You can visit the Environment Agency's website, which doesn't rip you off. And finally, three Swedish tourists get a surprise down under. They were swimming in Litchfield National Park in Northern Australia when they came across a croc on a rock taking in some rays. Eventually, it takes evasive action. The swimmers were unharmed. You are now up to date with Field Sports Britain News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next, even fishier than the fishy tales you hear on News Stump, it's the Angling Trust, who aim to be the voice of authority on extraction, on cormorants, but most of all, who want you to go fishing. The River Kennet in the Thames Valley is a beautiful place to fish, whatever the time of year, especially when you're allowed somewhere slightly off the beaten path. And that's when it helps to have friends in low places, sorry Martin, high places, such as mad keen fisherman and recently retired Member of Parliament for Reading West, Martin Salter. I mean, this is fantastic. 
fantastic. I mean, this is this is the Upper Kennet uh, uh, near Kimbury. Uh, it's where Passion for Angling was uh, filmed. Probably the greatest uh, angling movie uh, that was ever produced or, or series, angling TV series. Uh, people like Chris Yates and, and, and Bob James and Hugh Miles. People have been around the angling scene for a long, long time shot an iconic piece of film here and you know for me to be allowed to fish here just occasionally it's a real privilege and uh, yes I mean there are still some parts of Kennet which are, are wonderful despite all the problems that the river has and there are some good fish to be caught here as you can see. Joining Martin today is head of the Angling Trust Mark Lloyd and another Mark who has an impressive selection of exotic flies hanging off his hat. I thought dangly bits on hats were supposed to keep the flies away. Look at that beautiful fin there, beautiful dorsal fin here goes up, that's what gives them such power in the water when you're playing them in. Lovely, lovely fish. They only tolerate absolutely clean water. Today they're after chub, grayling, perch and dace. There are trout which don't seem to realise that the trout season hasn't started yet. There's even a wild one in the mix. Okay, now this is actually a wild trout. Uh, much nicer markings than the stock fish. Uh, more spots along that line there and you can see the fin it's not, not a trout that's been brought up in a stew, in a stew pond. It's a really natural. You see all the, all the rays in the fin there. No damage on it at all. Beautiful, beautiful little wild fish. I'd much rather catch one of these than one ten times its size. Martin may be retired from Parliament, but is still involved with politics, both in Westminster and in his role for the Angling Trust. And there are one or two burning issues he wants to get stuck into. Water abstraction is one. We're all drinking too much and bathing too often. Another is cormorant damage, and we shooters know what to do about that. He reckons the only way of dealing with these issues is by making as big a noise as possible. So we're a lot more unified than we've ever been. We've probably got more political clout uh, than we've had for an awful long time. Um, but it does need people pulling in the same direction. There's still not enough of, of us. Uh, I mean, for a sport of two to three million people, you know, we should have a lot more members and we should have a lot stronger voice, but we're in much better heart than we used to be 10 years ago, certainly. Mark is taking well to watching a float instead of a fly. He catches chub and grayling while Martin tries his luck with a dead cert perch pond. Just a very little young grayling. People think British fish are kind of dull coloured. They're very subtly coloured, but in fact they're beautiful. If you look at that, that fin, remarkable fish. Really lovely colours to it. And the, the gill plate again, that's a purple. The lady of the stream, they call them. Like millions of anglers across the country, he is passionate about his sport and of course wants people to join the Angling Trust to safeguard fishing for the future. Together, you know, we're a really large body of people and we could be really influential and, and be very powerful in terms of votes and politicians listen to votes. So it's really about protecting fish and fishing and by being unified and being a single body for all anglers, um, we're much more powerful. Wonderful. Fantastic. That was according to plan. Look at that. That is perfection. Look at that lovely bronze colour. Beautiful fish. The lovely red fins. They're just, uh, you know, one of our native coarse fish and, uh, and they're very secretive. They're very spooky. Uh, you, you often have to you show great stealth uh, catching them, so I'm pleased to have crept up on this one. And uh, what I did was just fed some maggots down this uh, this swim, let them drift down, and then I caught it just off that tree. I thought I hooked the tree actually, um, so I was pulling at that, and then uh, it started to swim upstream and uh, and turned into this. Not another trout, but uh, but a lovely chub. It's exactly what we were after, and I'm really pleased with that. Let's put it back. Mark also wants to influence the lawmakers. 
we're battling to some extent with the RSPB on the Cormorant issue and the, the RSPB has a million members and at the moment it's very, very difficult to get a licence to shoot them, even when you've got 60 cormorants on your fishery, you know, destroying, destroying your livelihood and a, and a rural business and, and the enjoyment of uh, thousands of people. Here we have trout with signs of cormorant attack. So here we've got, you can see where the cormorants tried to have a go at it, and even there as well. But that's a really nasty one. It's that, it's that beak jabbed down at it. Lovely fish, but it's been savaged. Twice, there's another one there. Fishing is a sport where technique and skill bring rewards, but it is also wonderfully therapeutic. So, instead of paying hundreds of pounds for counselling, join the Angling Trust, make a difference and go find yourself a stretch of water. Anglingtrust.net Anglers catching fish for us to film, we do like that. And there's more up there on the screen behind me. If you want to see our latest film on predator fishing, click on that. Now, over to shooting. It's Kit Special. Kit Special this week looks again at popular sporting guns on the gunsdirect.co.uk website. Which ones are getting the most views from you, the viewers? The answer is that anything made by Turks and Soviets is currently top of the gun pops. First up here is a CZ22 Rimi with thumbhole stock, scope mod and bipod for £550. CZ began manufacturing in what is now the Czech Republic in 1936. James Bond probably came up against more CZ guns than any other make. The Peace Dividend has brought with it a thriving sporting market for the arms manufacturer of choice of the KGB and Smirsch. Here's an Armsan semi-auto for £450. We always knew that Turkey is a great place to source walnut wood for gun stocks, but the Turks have only recently emerged as a gun-making nation. This 20 ball comes from a company that only started exporting in 2006. The last item is not a gun, it's ammo. The world ammunition shortage has led to extraordinary interest in 7.62x54R Tula cartridges at £26 per hundred. Who am I to pass comment on the quality of Tula ammunition? Google it for yourself. The stuff comes in airtight cans, however it was made in Novosibirsk, Russia in 1988. That's it, feast your eyes, fish into your pockets. Thanks for watching, this is Kit Special. Well, they say every day is a school day, so let's learn more about gun dogs. Thanks to the experts from Skinners. The hair is down. Here is the kind of retrieve that takes months of careful work to achieve. And here is top gun dog trainer Ricky Maloney to explain how to achieve it. What you see in there is you're actually seeing dogs, open dogs, that have been trained to a high level on a shooting day, would you be sending dogs those distances? Probably not. But what the reason that we're training dogs to go those distances is if we get birds that plane down a long way, by the time you've walked over, that bird's made good its escape. The quicker you can get a dog to the fall with as little disturbance as possible, hopefully, quicker you're going to put that game in the bag. So it was of no benefit that retrieved to my dogs. So what I did was offered it over to, to another one of the dog handlers. He sent his dog, really it is a straight line, every retrieve is a straight line. He sent his dog up, got it up onto the rise. Dog started just to cast, a little bit of whistling, a little bit of handling, push the dog back. It's teaching that dog that if it believes the handler, it's going to get success. Dogs don't understand distance. I think a dog doesn't understand how far something is. Back means go back, left means left, and right means right. So if you go limit back. your dog's training to only ever doing 30 odd retrieves, that becomes the norm. If you're stretching that dog and once it can do 30 yards, putting it then to 50 yards, and then 70 yards and building it up, 
Before long, the dog doesn't think about distance. You give it a line and it morphs out until you either tell it that that's the area or it finds it itself. Ricky Maloney runs Ribblesdale Labradors. This series on gun dog training tips is brought to you by Skinner's Pet Foods, maker of the field and trial range of gun dog feeds. Visit skinnerspetfoods.co.uk From dogs to the wider world of hunting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting, shooting and fishing videos that YouTube has to offer. This week we are at EWA 2013. What's EWA? It's Europe's version of the SHOT Show, with lots of sensible Europeans doing sensible deals about sensible sporting guns with no razzmatazz. And the video coverage? Profoundly sensible. Blaza Rifles has its own YouTube channel and in this film offers opening the EWA 2013 Impressions, which serves up its view of day one of the four day event. See? Sensible. OK, less sensible is our German friend Jörg Sprava's coverage of Iwa. His Slingshot channel visits his sponsor Cold Steel and others to see this year's zombie killing blades and axes, great arrow shooters and even a side-by-side -side rifle that is chambered for one inch diameter ammo. English channel The Shooting Show has an Iwa special report by Peter Carr including the new Mauser M12, Caesar Greeny Evolution, Browning 725 Black Edition and Browning Expelled GRS. Just because we are European, we can be shallow. Team ASG is an airsoft channel and its daily reports come from presenters lovelier by far than either Peter or Jörg. The girls are looking at some airsoft stuff, and that's just great. For black powder, go to Cap and Ball. It has a range of entertaining films about Iwa, including The Ugliest Pedasoli Gun Ever, a 2-2 Hornet Plinker with a full tactical feel, and a design by a GCSE student. Iwa is also about air guns, and Team Wild Hunting is just mad for the stuff from Real Tree. Webley and Scott, Gamo, Air Ops, Diana Crossman, FX, Daystate and Milbro in this video. The All Four Shooters channel romps through some of the kit available at Ewa in several films. Here is Armin Dobat of Carl Zeiss with his new products. Finally, our own humble offering. Well, we can't be nice about that, can we? It would be like laughing at our own jokes. Just the facts. The Zawa 101 Rifle, Blaza R8 Professional Success Rifle, Browning T-Bolt, RWS Evolution Green Ammunition, Zawa 202 Down Under, Zeiss Victory HT Scopes and Binary RWS Powerball Airgun Pellet and Webley and Scott's new Canon. That's all. You can click on any of these films to watch them. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, we are back next week when we have a chicken farm with a rat problem. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't hesitate to hit the subscribe button that's somewhere around the outside of the screen or whiz over to our webpage at fieldsportschannel.tv and click on the Facebook link to like us or the Twitter link to follow us or scroll down to the bottom and pop your email address into the constant contact form box and we will constantly contact you about our programme which is out at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain.